Hello everybody, it's Jonathan here again in the Royal Armouries collection, um, but not holding a gun this time. It's far too big and heavy for that. Um, and actually that's probably the most important feature of this historic weapon um, because, well, we'll come to that. This is the Panzerbuchser 38. Um, now, if you were following along over on social media, um, where we do a bit of a, a mini quiz on these relating to these videos, um, you don't have to engage with that, but if you'd like to, it might be fun. Uh, if you were guessing over there about this, you might have thought that this was the PZB 39, which is the much more famous, more prolific um, version of this design. Um, they're actually quite different in design, but the concept is the same. And that was to reinvent the anti-tank rifle. Germany had invented the anti-tank rifle in 1918 with the um, model 1918 tank gewehr, uh, firing the 13.2 millimeter tank und flieger cartridge, just an enormous beast of a round. Um, using in large part the mass of this enormous bullet uh, plus velocity of course but but mainly penetrating armor using mass and a steel core so the reinvention of this in 1930 or leading up to 1938 the idea was to create a similar car similarly huge cartridge but to drop the bullet diameter way down to the standard 7.92 millimeter service caliber uh, but a similar case capacity to get you the uh, powder burn and the velocity that you needed to accelerate this thing up to what we believe was about 3,500 feet per second. So this is an early version of what we would later call the small caliber, small caliber, high velocity, high velocity from the amount of powder uh, concept. And so um, this, this, would have limited penetration because it's traveling relatively slowly despite its large size, whereas this thing would in theory penetrate more armor. And based on tests, it looks like it did. Um, in fact, we'll briefly cover that. So um, post-war, the Allies tested this out and that velocity was, was recorded, about 3,500 feet per second, over 1,000 meters per second, which is, which is quite remarkable. And that would, that would apparently penetrate one and a quarter inches of um, face hardened steel, so not through hardened, not homogeneous steel armor, but still significant, at 100 yards. And it would still do an inch at 300 yards. So this thing was definitely capable of killing 1930s vintage tanks. As to the weapon itself, we'll go over to the table in a moment and have a, a bit of a deeper dive on how it actually works and why it's different to the PZB 39. Um, but a uh, broad background to this is that this was developed at the Gustloff Werk um, in 1938, funnily enough, hence the name. And it's a dropping block action, as you'll see in a moment. And it's, it's not quite manually, fully manually operated, and it's not really at all self-loading either. But more, more on that in a moment. Um, there is a, a, an ammunition hopper system because this is, this is a single shot rifle, so it cannot feed from a magazine or a clip, but there is a, a way to get ammunition quickly into the gun, which we'll also have a look at. Okay, guys, I would normally try to wave this in front of the camera and explain how it works. This thing's far too big and heavy to attempt that, so I have commandeered another setup. And we're on the back end, clearly, of the, of the BZ B38. Features of interest, buttstock assembly. Now this is also mechanically part of the gun. So, press this catch, pivots to one side. So in its most basic sense, this is just a folding buttstock to make it more compact. You obviously wouldn't want to shoot it like this. And in fact, you couldn't. Um, there is actually a, a mechanical lockout here that stops you from opening the breech when the buttstock is unfolded. Safety feature. In terms of um, function, as, as in how the buttstock is part of the, the mechanical function of the weapon, we're, we're not here to go into, into depth on this, but it's of interest, I think. This is a buffer tube. So if you're familiar with the Armalite series of rifles, AR-15, of course, being the most famous, 
that's exactly what this is. Um, in fact, if those of you who really know the AR know that there are versions with folding butt stocks where the whole buffer tube folds with the butt and then <laughs> snaps into place for firing, allowing the bolt to actually come physically into the butt stock. That's how the AR works. That's how this works. Except that it's not semi or fully automatic, as I'll explain in a moment. Before we do that, though, this feature here uh, is a little perplexing at first sight. So, a better view of it there. It's a, a stitched leather with, I think, a bit of wood inside to give it shape. And as far as I can gather, all this is, it's like a finger stop on a submachine gun front grip. So in that case, you don't want your hand going in front of the muzzle. In this case, you don't want your face going forward of this point here. Um, not because the breech block comes back that far, but it does come back this far. And this um, dust cover flap thing is free to some extent in recoil to flick down. And you could get a nasty, um, you could get a nasty um, flick in the eye or the cheek from that, I imagine. Uh, it would also be quite off-putting. <laughs> so clearly, they uh, discovered in actual use, they decided that there's a need for this protective stop on the buttstock. And you've already seen there how the breech block mechanism works. So you'll see it move here. You'll see it uh, it's visible moving here as well. We actually have a lift up top cover to show you the full glory of the breech end of the barrel and the dropping breech block. I'll show you that again. So that just gets that just gets cammed down as this thing comes to the rear. So you you, you fire your shot, the thing comes back, drops the breech block, throws out the uh, the empty case, presumably overcoming this flap here, which also prevents you getting struck in the face by it. The empty case that is, and then it should lock open in this position. Now this one is clearly not in, not it's seen better days, and it is not locking open. So if I let it go, it flies forward again. But what should happen is that this stays in the rear position, allowing you, when you grasp the pistol grip, to press that lever just automatically as you grab it. You don't have to think about it. That allows the thing to be released forward, like a hold open catch on a self-loading firearm. But this is not a self-loading firearm. This is a sort of semi-semi-automatic. <laughs> so all it's doing, uh, and in this respect, this is rather like the uh, short-lived lever release firearms that were available in the UK for a short time, where the breech block, uh, they, they, um, they self-eject and extract, but then they lock to the rear and you have to manually release the working parts forward. Now that was done for legal reasons, this is done, um, well, why was this done? <laughs> Given that they went to the PZB39, which is entirely manually operated, um, Forgotten Weapons video on that, go and check it out. Why would you do this semi-semi-automatic feature? Well, I think the main reason is recoil. Um, rather than stick a big muzzle brake on the front of the gun, in fact, we can have a look at that. So rather than stick a large muzzle brake on the gun to lim eliminate recoil, we've got a conventional cone flash hider. So it's not using a Boys or Barrett style brake to redirect the, the muzzle gases to counteract some of the recoil. Um, it does have the big rubber butt pad. We do have a nice thick rubber butt pad here that will do something, but most of your recoil mitigation is from the delay induced by the whole barrel recoiling with the breech block. So it doesn't eliminate the recoil, but it slows down uh, the transfer of that energy to your shoulder, making it more comfortable to shoot. So I believe there isn't a great deal of information out there on this, but I believe the convenience of rapidly loading a second shot with your semi-semi-automatic uh, function is secondary to the recoil mitigation 
idea. If anyone knows different, please do let us know. So one more feature I want to show you, and that's this rather splendid ammunition carrier, container, hopper, whatever you want to call it. It's not a magazine and it's not a clip, although inside, we spring it open, and this is sprung by the way, so you just strike that with your thumb and it would flick open, ready to access 10 rounds of your funky 792 on steroids ammunition. Um, I won't force this in because it does damage the brass each time you slide one of these into these because these are spring steel like, like a clip or, or a machine gun belt link to make sure that these things don't go anywhere till such time as you want to pull them out and insert them. Now the way this worked in service is this on the side slots onto, this, onto the weapon. As I say, you flick it open and with the breech block locked to the rear, ready to accept a cartridge, you draw a cartridge from your hopper, insert it into the, into the breech, flap slightly gets in the way, but not too bad, shove that in like, a, like an artillery shell, and then reach down, and as soon as you grasp the pistol grip, the working parts go forward, ready for the next shot. So this system, um, when it's functioning, <laughs> did work. It was a sound design, it was put into mass production, but only 2,000 were produced between 1938 and 1940. Um, pretty early on, they must have identified that this thing was too heavy, and probably too expensive due to being too complicated to be the, the ideal host for this very promising cartridge and concept. And so the cartridge persisted and a new rifle was designed, the Panzerbuchse uh, 39. And the dates there give you a clue. So if only 2,000 were made at low rate production in two years from 1938 to 1940, and they're already introducing the Panzerbuchse 39 in 1939, there's not a period of much more than a year where anyone can have been happy with this thing. And that overall, the overall weight of 35 pounds, um, nearly 16 kilos, not perhaps unexpected for a rifle, uh, for a self-loading anti-materiel or anti-tank rifle, but it was, yeah, there was room for improvement and f purely from the over, the over complexity of, of this thing just didn't make sense. You were not getting the advantages of a self-loading design, uh, rapid follow-up shots. Um, the advantage of soaking up recoil with the recoiling barrel and breech was tangible, but you can, approximate that with an efficient muzzle brake on the end of the barrel to redirect the muzzle gases and pull the gun forward to counteract some of that rearward impulse. So why go for this hybrid system? It didn't really make any sense. Hence, this thing is super rare and we're really fortunate to have one in the Royal Armouries collection. So thank you as always for watching. Um, I think this one's a, a bit of a doozy, but then I enjoy all of these as hopefully you do as well. Join us again next time here for one of these. Have a look at our social media if you're, if you're into that because um, we do a fair bit over there, not just on firearms. Um, more videos on this channel. They won't all just be on firearms either. Um, I did host a, uh, uh, the first of our winter lecture program a few days ago. So that's up to, to, to watch if you're interested to do that. We have the usual links in the description for donations, membership. Um, you can head over to the website look at uh, the shop, um, events, and details on visiting. If you're in the UK or visiting the UK, um, we've had a, an American contact over here visiting us uh, this week, which is great to see after all this time. Uh, please do visit us. We'd, we'd, love you, we'd love to see you at one of our three sites. Um, I'll see you again next time. Thanks, guys.